Anybody here last week for Bishop? That guy's great. I, I just love that guy. And um, I was really honored to have the Bishop of the Church of God here for California and Nevada. If you missed it, his, uh, if you go on our website, you can click on all the messages. And uh, you can definitely listen to his messages. I thought it was awesome. So I was uh, reading some... I read some Bible scriptures the last few days, and uh, there was, for some reason, I, just something stuck out in my head. It was about, uh, in Matthew, and it was talking about how the first are going to be last, and the last will be first. And the ones that are the greatest, the ones that really strive for something to really do here on earth, that make their mark, are actually going to be the least. And uh, the least will be the greatest. So I'm trying to figure out exactly what that means. So I'm looking around and I'm starting to think about all these Bible scriptures. I started finding this in. Um, talking about that is going to be uh, Matthew 19, 16 through 30. About the decision about to accept Jesus as Savior. And that's the rich young ruler. Matthew 20 was the same thing. In a sense that after Jesus told his disciples about the rich young ruler. That he went into another story about laborers. And they started arguing about who was the greatest. And then it's again in Luke. It's about people that chose not to have a relationship with God. Mark 9.35 is about believers and serving others because Jesus is your Savior. Um, there's a lot. There was a lot. Before I start getting this message, I, I want to tell you um, a story. Uh, something happened to me when I was a kid. I like telling stories about me when I was a kid because I was kind of messed up. <laughs> so uh, um, I wish I had a harp. Every time I said, let me tell you a story about how, you know, you know those harp sounds? I remember when, I wish I had that. Um, all right, so I went to the movies one night. And I was with a friend of mine. I was about 12. And I don't know exactly what the movie was. I think it might have been like a Star Wars something, I think. Mike? Yeah. I was here for Star Wars. And... Uh, so we went to this movie, it's a really long line. And the theater was like this. It was like, the theater's up here, this big building was really beautiful, and this had this, this flat part, and then this beautiful stairway, and then like the sidewalk, and there was people all the way from the top of the building getting the door all the way down to the sidewalk, and then around. So we were waiting to get into this movie, and we've been there for a while, and all of a sudden this couple, two couples, walked, you know, down the sidewalk, led by this guy. It was, you know, kind of an aggressive guy. And he was leading his group of people, it looks like his wife and maybe another couple, all the way to the very front of the building. And they just kind of, you know, kind of did this into the line. Anybody ever done that before? No. <laughs> but everybody's seen that happen before. It's frustrating. So this guy went up there and people around him were started complaining. There was like a little fight going on. And uh, all of a sudden we were kind of looking at me and my friends going, oh man, watch this. Because out here comes the usher. And the usher goes up to this guy and says, hey sir, I'm sorry, can you kind of go to the back of the line? And you kind of cut in. And I heard the guy say, no, nah, it's no big deal. It's just four of us. It's no problem. And he left and the manager came out. And the manager came up and said, Sorry, sir, you've got to go to the back of the line. You just can't cut like this. And I heard the guy again say, and he was really loud. And I can still picture, I know what he looks like, and I know what his wife looks like. And it's like, you know, 30 some years ago. So, uh, and all of a sudden, um, the, guy, the manager walks in, and all of a sudden we hear, Woo! the police show up. So the police show up, yeah. The police show up and they walk up. There's four police officers and they walk up to this couple, right? And again, they say, sir, you've you got to go. Just leave. And the guy still kind of argued. And here's the weird thing. The officer said, just follow me. Just come with me for a second. And this guy made a really big mistake. As he was walking with the police officers, I don't know what he was doing. Uh, he just kind of goes, well... I don't know what the problem is, officer. And he puts his arm around the officer. Oh. Right. And the officer had no idea what this guy was thinking. I mean, if you're just, and all of a sudden you feel this on you, the cop behind the, uh, the gentleman that put his arm around him just grabbed him. Didn't know what was going to happen. Threw him against the wall, put cuffs on him. I could hear the wife crying, why are they doing that to my husband? And, I, and I'm just thinking, why? You want to know why? <laughs> so they put the guy in the cop car and they <laughs> take him away. 
that's the story that came to my mind when I started looking at these scriptures and started about talking. Amen. Okay. So what happened was they took this guy away in the cop car. And I'm thinking, well, that guy really deserved it. He really thought he was going to get away with something. What I didn't get is how many times they told him to get to the back of the line and he wouldn't do it. So I'm going to start reading from Matthew 19. Someone came to Jesus with this question, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? Jesus looked at him and said, okay, look. You got to keep the commandments. You can't murder, you can't lie, you can't cheat, you can't steal. You've got to honor your mother and father. You got to love your neighbor. And this rich young ruler guy looks at Jesus and says, I've done all that. I, I've kept them. I, I, I'm good. I'm good. What else must I do to get in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus says, Okay, look, here's what you have to do you have a lot of stuff. Go sell your possessions. Give all your money to the poor. And then you'll have treasure in heaven. Then you got to come and follow me. Serve people with me. But when the young man heard this, you guys know the story, right? Kind of put his head down, looked away sad because he had a whole lot of possessions. He didn't want to give them up. And he walked away. Most times, that's where you kind of stop in that story. But I'm going to keep reading. Jesus said, look, I tell you, it's really hard for people with a lot of possessions, for rich people in the sense that hang on to this material stuff. Rich doesn't necessarily mean that you have multitudes and multitudes. I mean, if you have one prized possession, you can't give up. It's kind of what Jesus is talking about. It's harder for that, for those people to get in the kingdom of heaven. And Peter says, you know, we've given up everything to follow you, Lord. Everything. Is it, who's going to get into heaven? And Jesus says, listen, many are the greatest now, will be the least important then, and those who seem the least important now will be the greatest then. See, the rich young ruler put himself before Jesus, ahead of serving Jesus. So I'm going to give you a straight point. That's your first highlight. I've been there. I know what that means when you put possessions and things in front of your relationship with God. See, I... Although, in a sense, I'm kind of like that guy in a lot of ways that there was times in my life I tried to cut in line. Um, I didn't exactly get arrested, but in a lot of ways, I crashed and burned. Jesus gave the rich young ruler an opportunity to show that no possession was more valued than Jesus. That following Jesus and going out to serve others is more important than himself. And that he placed his Savior above everything. And he didn't do it. So I'm going to highlight a couple things for you. Your search to be first or number one or somebody's search to be number one in the world versus your desire to be number one in God's world. So kind of here is what Jesus wanted this rich young ruler to realize. The world is about saving your stuff. God's world is about saving your soul. In this world, it's about serving yourself. But in God's world, it's about serving others. In this world, it is totally, absolutely, 100% about you, about yourself. But in God's world, it's about your Savior. There's two other verses I want to go through real quick. In Matthew 20, 1 through 16, it talks about the kingdom of heaven being like a landowner, a landowner who needed workers. So he goes out in the morning and he finds workers at a marketplace. He brings them over early in the morning. He hires them for the standard going rate, a denarii, which is like about a dollar. It's about a dollar nowadays, really. But back then, it's like 100 bucks. So he needed more. He went back at 12, went back at 3, and he kept getting these workers, understanding he'd pay them the exact same amount. By the end of the day, he made one more trip, got more workers, went out, and paid them the exact same wage again. At the end of the, at the, end of the day, the owner told the foreman to go out, call the workers in, beginning with the last workers he hired first. And he paid them equally. Then he called the next ones he hired and paid them until he got to the people that he hired first and paid them, and they started complaining. They started saying, wait a minute. You know, I've been working all day long, and here's the point. 
I've been working for a long time. I've done so much for you. I've been working since early this morning. This guy comes in at the very end and he gets paid the exact same amount I do. The landowner goes, wait a minute. You agreed to work for that. I can do what I choose to with my money. If I give to everybody equally, isn't that the point? Should you be jealous because I'm kind to others? So those who are last now will be first then, and those who are first will be last. Here's a point. Actually, there's a lot of points in this story, but here's the one I believe we're to focus on. The thing about the Lord is that he gives his mercy and love to people equally. Think about that one more time. The last will be first, and the first will be last. So no matter how long somebody has served the Lord, 50 years, five days, if you've accepted the Lord, you get into heaven equally, just like the pastor who's been serving for 50 years, because God's mercy is equal to everybody. He doesn't show any favorites. Now, I know there's a lot of different points in that, but I wanted to focus on this because Jesus specifically said that the last will be first and the first will be last. So here's the other note. God's word does teach that depending on your service here on earth, your service, it depends on what type of reward you may expect in heaven. But that's a different subject, a different teaching than the Lord loving everybody and showing mercy to everybody. Think about the people on their deathbed who gave their lives to the Lord, that they got into heaven. And do you expect a, a somebody that's been serving the Lord for 25 years, wait a minute, that's not fair. Uh, I've been, you know, all this years and all I had to do was on my deathbed, really? That's not the way it works. See, in Luke 13, 22 through 30, it tells another version. Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching as he went, always pressing towards Jerusalem. And someone asked him, Lord, will only a few be saved? And then Jesus starts talking about the narrow road, the door that's narrowed to get into the kingdom of heaven. Many are really going to try. They're going to do everything they think they can do here on earth to get themselves into heaven. But when they get there, the door is going to be closed and locked, and it's going to be too late. And God's going to say, I don't know you. And they're going to say, well, wait a minute. I, I, you know, I, I, I saw you preach in the streets. You know, uh, we talked about you. I, you know. But it's too late. Some who seem least important now will be the greatest then. And some who are the greatest now will be the least important then. Think about that rich young ruler. Imagine him getting into heaven to be turned away and him saying, but wait a minute, we talked. You know, you, 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 know, you told me what I needed to do, but you know, I kept all your commandments. And Jesus says, I'm sorry, I, I don't know you. Here's your next highlight. See, when you don't make that decision to serve God and you accept Jesus, there's a point. Folks, it's too late. It's too late. It's like that man that cut in line to the theater. I, I thought about this. He was given four chances to go back to the end of the line, to do the right thing. Four times. When he cut in line, the people around were going, hey, you can't do this. You've got to do the right thing. Go get back in line like everybody else did. And he didn't do it. Then the usher came out and said, hey, you got a chance to do the right thing. Get back in line. And he didn't do it. The manager came out and said, hey, you got a chance to get back in line and do the right thing. And he didn't do it. The fourth time, the police came. And it was too late. See, the guy didn't remember this. The guy just didn't get back to the end of the line like he was supposed to. He didn't even get in the building. He never even got in. Mark 35. Serving others because Jesus is Savior. I think this might be my favorite version of this. Jesus and his disciples are walking through uh, Capernaum on their way to Capernaum. And they're just on a road and they're talking. And... Jesus heard them talking about something. He heard them arguing about stuff. When they got back to the house, Jesus said, what were you guys talking about? Jesus knew what they were talking about, but they didn't answer. They were a little bit embarrassed because they had been arguing about which one of them was the greatest. 
Which one was the favorite? Which one was the greatest? He sat down and he said, whoever wants to be first must take last place and be the servant of everybody else. So they fought over things that would have put them at the head of the line in Jesus' eyes. And I was thinking, I could imagine them. I can imagine Peter going, wait, I'm the greatest. You know, I walked on water for a few steps, right? And I could hear John saying, well, I'm the greatest disciple because, you know, I'm Jesus' favorite, right? And Thomas is like, well, I had no doubt this time. I'm, I'm the favorite. Um, and then I like, I, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of supposing here, but I'm figuring Matthew was saying something like, well, you know, I used to work for the IRS. <laughs> I must be kind of important there, you know, as a tax collector. Um, so here's your next highlight. Who is the greatest is not decided on what we accomplish serving others or ourselves, but who is the greatest and the first is determined on what we accomplish for other people. It is not about ourselves, yet we make it about ourselves so many times, and a lot of times it's not even our intention to. We just do. Once again, it's like that guy who cut in line. He placed himself ab above everybody. He thought he could just move right in and it wouldn't make a difference. It was just put himself at the front of the line. And remember I told you where he said, hey, it's no big deal. I can still hear him saying that. It's weird. Hey, it's no big deal. It's just four of us. It's not going to make a difference. But it did. It, it made an effect on everybody else. If you think about it, I was thinking about this a couple nights ago. When somebody puts themselves ahead of you on purpose and they don't give you a, a care or a concern, see, the people that were standing in line, I mean, literally, he pushed us back. I mean, he did. He pushed us back. He affected if we got in, what time we got in, where we sat. You know, I know that he basically was a poor example, but at the same time, he also, he also could have influenced other people to do the same thing, to cut in line. And I know he... he ticked a lot of people off. You got a lot of people angry. The people that are about themselves, they try to get in front of everybody else, but they don't only really just damage themselves. They really do damage to others. We got to start thinking about how we can serve other people. Literally, if you want to start practicing how to put people ahead of you, think about being first in a line, the literal sense of being first in a line. I mean, I applaud people when I, when I see them open a door for somebody. You know, if somebody's struggling, I say, oh, let me get that door for you. You go ahead. I like it when I see a grocery store and there's, there's people with a big cart full of stuff and maybe somebody only has one or two items and they go, no, 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 you go ahead of me. It's okay. You go ahead. Yeah, if anybody go to Starbucks, coffee, if you haven't quite made up your mind, have you ever stood behind somebody who goes, well, I don't know, a grande, vente, I don't know, it's, you know, I, you stand behind those. It'd be really great if, if, if that was ever you, if you'd go, you know what, I haven't made up my mind yet. Why don't you guys go ahead and go first? I like that. Here's a big one. For anybody that drives, all right. Have you ever been stuck in a driveway and you're trying to like pull out of a gas station or something and there's just these people going and going and, the, and just nobody lets you in? Well, I, my wife will tell you this. I was pretty much the guy that wouldn't let you in, you know? I just, I would get in a car and something would happen to me. I'm not like that anymore, but... <laughs> now I joke about it. If I'm driving and somebody does something that doesn't let me in, I'll just kind of walk by and go, Oh, you! God bless you! <laughs> so, you know, I'm really trying. I'm really trying. Here's the thing. It's not just these acts of service that are going to do something. We talked a couple of weeks ago about what your motive was and what's your motive for these services, for these things that you do for others. Not to lift yourself up, but to lift Jesus up. On the big scope of things, this is where I'm going to make this kind of personal to this uh, ministry. This church has to, 100%, has to be about serving people. We're only four months old. Last week was our four month anniversary. Woo! Yeah, yeah. I feel like a teenager. It's our four month anniversary today. <laughs> and we're teenagers, we've been dating three weeks today, you know. 
we've been here four months. Uh, and I have two daughters. I've heard that once in a while. So look what so-and-so gave me for our nine-week anniversary. Okay, cool. <laughs> we've got to be about people. Look, we have to. We have to be about all people. And I'm going through those Bible verses that we talked about, and I kind of categorize them a little bit for you. Matthew 19 and Luke 13, that was about loving people who don't know Jesus, helping them decide by introducing them to Christ. Like the rich young ruler, Jesus gave him a chance to make the right decision, and he didn't. If you look at our mission statement, the number one thing we want to do is introduce people to God. We want them to know who Jesus is. Mark 9.35 is about loving and helping people who know and love God, but they might be struggling. They're serving and serving. They might be a little burnt out, and sometimes they think that the things that they have done have not earned them what they deserved. There are some people that are just struggling with life and their faith. They've been beaten up by life. Maybe sometimes they brought stuff upon themselves and maybe sometimes they didn't. It's just life is difficult. Those are also the people that Rock of Life wants to minister to because that's pretty much who we are. We struggle. We have tough times. You guys know what we go through sometimes individually. Getting through life is difficult. Rocket Life, we have to be a church of unity that we look at all of our brothers and sisters out there, no matter what church they go to, as long as it's Bible-based, real doctrine, sound, they have Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I want to partner up with those people. I, I, I heard something great that a pastor from um, Church of God over in um, the Community Church of God said, and uh, he said, really, there's only one church. We just meet in a whole bunch of different buildings. And I've said that before because I really believe that. You look at what the Lord's talking about, and there's people out there that are brothers and sisters that are struggling. Let's just love on them, and let's just serve on them, and all these other piddly things that we tend to get in the way. Put those aside, folks. Just put them aside. And just love and help people who may be struggling. Matthew 20, loving and equipping people who are who need to, to grow in the Lord, whether they've served for five days or 25 years. God's mercy is for everybody. We have to get to the point where we look at people and think, time is getting short. Life is difficult every day. I mean, boy, does anybody look at the news? Does anybody ignore the news? It's hard. And if there's one thing I really believe God's calling us to do, that's serve people. Love them. Show them some love. You don't have any idea what time, what time, uh, what, sometimes what people go through. You don't know. I, and I've, I've been quick to judge in my life a lot with people. And I've told you about an issue I had when I was younger. I just write people off. We can't afford to do that anymore. If you look at the scripture that says the, the narrow door, people are doing things out in this world right now that think that, that they think is going to get them into heaven. And, and it's not. I feel this urgency. I feel frustrated when I sometimes look at fellow brothers in Christ and sisters in Christ and I see them distracted. They don't feel the urgency that there's people out there that need help. Good people. People that are struggling, whether they've known the Lord for five days or 50 years. This church has to be a church that goes out and serves people. And the short four months that we've been open, um, this urgency inside of me is even growing even more. I want to partner with other people in communities. I want to partner with other churches. I want to be. I want to be part of a family that doesn't look at each other and let the enemy come in and divide them. I like it when I walk up to somebody and go, "Hey, what church you go to?" Well, oh, great, yeah. wonderful. And the point is to help people's spiritual maturity so they can go out and serve people in those first two groups I talked about. The ones that need to make the decision and the ones that are struggling. So once we've made that decision to serve Christ, 
And once we get on a path that we feel like, okay, I'm, I have some breathing room now. I feel like I'm growing. I feel like I'm taking ground. I don't feel like I'm struggling and walking backwards. I actually feel like I'm on the right path now. As you grow in your maturity and your relationship with God, now you have to go back and start over again. Go help the people that need help. Go out there and the people that need to make a decision for Christ, that's your service. That's what you need to do. We are to place others ahead of us. And then we'll be in that proper position with God. And especially later when we get into heaven. Going first is not always the best when it's about you. Trust me, I've been a musician for a long time, played in clubs, and it's a lot of times it's just about me. I know what that feels like. And I don't ever want to be that person again. Going first is not always the best when it's about you. In God's world, going first is when you place others before you. All right, last thing. That's what Jesus did on the cross. He placed himself at the end of the line so that we could all be first. So let's be Jesus. Let's pray. If you can bow your heads, please. Father God, I thank you for what you're doing. I thank you, Lord, that your word is pretty straightforward. And sometimes I think we make it more difficult than it is. We look at this and we can read, don't put yourself first, put others first, and everything will be taken care of. Even in your word in Matthew 6, it says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything else will be taken care of. Everything else will be added to us. Lord, help us to be the servants that you want us to be. But most of all, Lord, help us to grow and see other people more valuable than ourselves. Not be caught up in our cares and in our ambitions. But to put other people first and care about them and take care of them and serve them. Because that's what you did for us. I thank you for that, Lord. And if, if you can still keep your head bowed and your eyes closed, please. I, I'm also... With nobody looking around, just keep your eyes closed, please. If you need to make that decision, there's no way I, I can let you walk out of here today without doing one of two things. I need to introduce you to Christ. And number two, if you already know the Lord, maybe you just want to rededicate yourself as a servant of Christ. So I'm going to ask you to say this prayer with me, please. Jesus, it's time, Lord. I need you. I'm sorry for ignoring you. Forgive me for what I've done, Lord. Forgive me for my sin and not obeying your commandments. Lord, I choose to put you first in my life. I ask you to come into my heart and lead me, Lord. Help me to be who you want me to be and to serve others and to put you first, Christ. I thank you for that. And Lord, I also thank you to help me look at the opportunity to serve the others around me. Keep your eyes closed, please. If anybody said that prayer, can you just shoot your hand up real quick, please? Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. And I thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name I pray. And I just give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name, and we all said... Amen. Thank you, Lord.